A Tall and Small Collection Chapter 2 Soren and the Fierce Feline It was painstaking, but Soren was beginning to feel more secure about his family's living quarters. He had moved them further into the barren halls between the walls past the rooms that smelled of litter and mothballs, but not as far as the human home he borrowed from who were fighting and shouting. It made him slightly uneasy to live so close to humans who he knew were going to be present, but that wasn't new. Even though it was a little colder, the halls of the empty rooms were far safer for his two younger brothers to speak freely than a warmer place where an angry human might punch through the wall and reveal their home. Soren went on frequent borrowing trips just to get enough food to last the day. Already he had also managed to secure three days' worth of food from picking up scraps of bread and a box of slightly stale raisins from behind one of the cabinets. With a little water from melted snow, it wasn't hard to chew and gave his brother something to work on while Soren occupied himself with tasks. Organizing their makeshift pantry and guarding camp made Brady busy. He was so paranoid that a cat would find its way into the passages between the walls that he spent most of his time guarding Soren's brothers. This left all the borrowing to Soren, and he was relieved that this was the case. Brady's incompetence had already forced one move, and the eldest brother didn't want another blunder so close to winter. It also gave Soren a chance to observe the humans in the other rooms of the house. He realized, after only two weeks of observation, that the rooms were sectioned off into things called apartments. It explained why rooms belonged to some humans and not others. It was fascinating that so many humans could live in the same building but live completely different lives. Soren spent a lot of time observing the humans of the building so he could learn their patterns. Maybe it would be weird or creepy to a human, but Soren had a fascination with watching their behavior. He moved from room to room to get a clear understanding of the big people's schedules and when would be good to go to borrowing. Unfortunately, it was easy to get turned around in the walls. Soren sometimes had trouble keeping his directions straight, and he knew his brothers would too, especially if they were in an emergency. It was Soren's youngest brother, Ray, who came up with an idea to help them navigate the corridors. Ray suggested using different colored thread to guide the way to different rooms. It would consume a lot of supplies, but using different threads to guide the way to different rooms was the smartest thing to do. As long as they held onto the line, they couldn't get lost. In order to do this, Soren would need thread, and lots of it. Based off of his observations, there was only one place he could go, and he didn't like it. Soren prepared his bag, his hooks, and his needle, resolve in his heart. He knew there were two outlets which led into a side room filled with paper scraps, scissors, and, above all, thread. Turns out the smelly cat lady worked with her nimble fingers with thread and fabric to make clothes and crafts, though Soren could only suspect who those were for. It was early in the morning when Soren prepared to set out. He hoped he could make it there and back before his brothers woke up. Sadly, his stirring made them spring up out of their beds in an instant. They clung to his bag and begged him to take them along. "'We'll be good and listen, won't we, Ray?' prompted Dorian. His younger brother nodded vigorously. "'Yes, we'll be the best!' "'Please, let us come with you,' pleaded Ray. Soren smiled and ruffled his brother's hair playfully. The boy's hair was long enough now that it covered the tops of his fingers completely. Unlike himself, his brothers took after the, his mother— kind and smooth round faces that always seemed to be smiling. Their eyes, pale blue, and hair, which was a light sandy brown, reminded him every day of the pieces he wished he had of her. Soren took more after his father, Aaron. His features were thinner and his body more flexible. His borrowing kept him strong, deceptively so. He didn't want to leave them behind, but they were nowhere near ready for their first borrowing trip. Instead, he sighed and smiled, kneeling to be at eye level with them. "'Not today, Bobbins,' he muttered. His brothers' eyes twinkled at the mention of their mother's affectionate nickname for them. "'You have to stay put and guard the fort you never named.' His playful rebuke was enough to quiet his brothers. With that, he gave a simple salute and headed into the labyrinth of walls before him. The smell was overwhelming. Soren took a moment and breathed deeply to calm himself, but the stench only put him more on edge. He knew he was fast. 
He knew he was flexible and could outmaneuver anything thrown or swung his way. Still, he didn't want to use his abilities if he didn't have to. Soren listened carefully, refusing to breathe until he heard some sign of life. If he was right, the elderly woman would be rustling in the kitchen for an hour or so, with the cat begging at her heels. He had maybe two hours before needing to remain absolutely silent and undetected. Barely enough time and entirely risky. He pushed the faceplate off of the electrical cords and stepped out into the human world. It was always so vast and dizzying, the world of the humans. The tables and chairs towered above his head. The desks and trinkets were massive and often too bulky for a borrower. It took true ingenuity to even maneuver even the smallest of the human's things for borrowing. But Soren had a clever mother and a determined father. They taught him many tricks, one of which was to find a piece which he and his siblings were called after so affectionately, a bobbin. He could fill a bobbin instead of taking the whole spool of thread, which was precisely what Soren was going to do. Soren readied himself before he, in a burst of speed, sprinted from the walls to the nearest wooden table. He swung his hook with all his might and watched the line fly from his hands. With a quick flick of his wrist, the hook twitched and lodged itself into the soft wood table. Lodged on the first try. Soren didn't have time to celebrate his victory as he climbed hand over fist until he reached the top of the table. He kept low, resting the entire front of his body on the table from behind the sewing machine. His heart pounded from the sudden burst of energy. Just a foot from him rested a sewing box. Soren's mother told him that it was commonplace for humans to keep small supplies for sewing like needles, bobbins, and scraps of thread in the box. His heart stopped pounding, and after taking a breath, he stealthily crept to the box and forced the edges apart. Inside was a plethora of supplies, everything he and his family could use for months. Still, that wasn't the borrower way. Don't take more than what you need. With a reluctant sigh, he pulled out two sewing needles from the strange circular pack. He also pulled out one of many bobbins, which was filled with thread and found an empty one under one of the pin cushions. The oldest brother grinned and placed everything in his bag, along with a few large buttons and the needles. Soren glanced around, satisfied with his borrowing. That's when he spotted it, a plastic bag filled with mismatched pieces of fabric and half-used spools of thread. The scraps were usable, barely two inches in any direction, at least unusable for a human. For a borrower, on the other hand, the scraps were perfect for countless projects. The fabric would undoubtedly make better bedding and help line the floors and walls for insulation. They could make new clothes and hammocks to place their belongings off the ground. There was, however, an obvious problem. Moving the fabric took time. Since the pieces were in a bag, all he would need to do is push the bag to the ground. Humans with pets often blamed their pets for things spilling and making their way under furniture. If he was going to attempt this, Soren would undoubtedly make noise, potentially summoning the cat. An image of his brothers shivering on the ground flashed in his mind. Soren made his decision. The risk was worth it. He would have to be quick, but he knew he could do it. Soren's heart pounded in his chest. This was stupid, beyond stupid. This is the sort of thing his parents would box his ears over. Should he wait? Should he abandon the scraps of the human's and the promise of warmth for his siblings? While he crouched by the sewing machine and pondered these things, he heard a soft jingle of a bell. A cat's bell. A shiver crawled up his spine. He whipped around to see two enormous fluffy paws cresting over the edge of the table and the tips of two ears in a chair nearby. This was his chance. Sorden straightened up and snapped his fingers, gaining the cat's attention. Its ears twitched at the sound. Its nose and eyes peered over the table slowly, menacingly. It had caught scent of its prey. Soren watched the cat's movements carefully. Soren's father taught him that animals had their tells, and that a quick sway before a pounce was the tell of a cat ready to attack. Soren kept his body taut and prepared to leap. Wait. Wait. There! The cat swayed once, twice, and then wiggled its haunches rapidly before it sprang. Soren could feel the creature's breath on his back as he leapt out of the way toward the plastic bag filled with scraps and thread. He tumbled out of the way and was on his feet in a second. He grabbed the edge of the bag and rustled it. Come and get it, Fluffy, he growled. 
The cat growled right back and swiped at him with its paws, but he was ready. The cat's paw slashed at the bag, ripping the plastic into fine ribbons. Several spools of thread began to slip from the holes. Soren didn't have a moment to lose. He threw himself against the bag as the cat backed up and pounced again, this time tipping the bag onto the very edge. With the cat's back turned while it searched the bag for him, Soren darted across the table to his rappel line. He knew the rope burn against his palms was going to hurt, but it was going to be all right and far better than the alternative of being a kitty toy. He seized the line and threw himself off of the table. The cat, in a spasm and flurry of movement, spun around toward him and launched itself toward the eldest borrower. As it did, its back legs sent the bag flying off of the edge of the table and onto the ground. Soren crashed to the ground, hands stinging and burning as he reached the floor. He couldn't hold back now. He dared not hold back now. Soren pulled his hook free with a rapid thrash of his arm before he sprinted for his life toward the wall. He could sense the cat's eyes searching for him, but he could sense something else. Tremors. Shuffling tremors. He knew what this had to be. Jada? What are you doing here, Jada? The human's booming voice, even elderly, sent chills up Soren's spine. He forced his thoughts out of his head and threw himself into his instincts. He was now only inches away from the entrance into the walls. He dove through the hole, miraculously missing his head against the far wall. The now frantic borrower whipped around and pulled the cover behind him just as he saw an illuminated eye peer at him, seething and hissing viciously. Now, Jada, you've gone and made a mess. Come along. Soren listened as the cat growled in its master's arms as the elderly lady shuffled away to put the cat in another room. Soren wanted to rest. He wanted to recover and sit for an age, but he couldn't do that now. He was victorious, but couldn't celebrate until he had those fabric pieces in the walls with him. Soren forced himself to his feet and peered out of the hole once again. He spotted the old lady with the cat leaving the room as she closed the door behind her. Wow. That was actually perfect. The human is out of the room, and she locked the cat out. Soren could have sworn the cat made eye contact with him in a deep-seated hatred as the door clicked shut. With the door closed, Soren slid back outside of the wall cover into the bag of cloth, scraps, and thread. It took nearly 30 minutes, but Soren managed to pull out the necessary fabric and thread and pull them back behind the walls. Soren knew it was probably too much, but the lady was older and most likely forgetful. He hoped she wouldn't notice at any rate. Soren had been told that older humans were often forgetful. After his encounter, Soren took a moment on his pile of fabric. It was too close, far too close. Soren couldn't believe he had allowed himself to risk his life for some scraps of fabric. He laid back and stretched against the cloth. It was so soft, almost unbelievably so. Perhaps for fabric this soft, it was worth it. I can't wait to see the bobbins' reactions when they see this. Soren closed his eyes and let his pounding heart slow. He deserved a moment to himself, and gladly took it as his personal victory.